Thank you for joining us on Light of the Vedas. This is your host, Sri Sachidandan Das. In our previous episode, we discussed the birth of the sage Vyasadeva, as well as the time cycles described in the ancient Vedic literatures. We would like to discuss these time cycles or yuga cycles in more detail, as well as the Vedic religion itself and the different practices that individuals took up and the rituals they performed at different stages of their life. The Vedas describe that way back in ancient times, humanity was much different than they are today. There was no modern technology. People essentially lived in harmony with nature, much like the yogis live in the forest today, even today. Uh, up in the mountains of the Himalayas, of the jungles of India, you can find sages just living on fruits and roots and you know, living a very humble, simple life, bathing in the sacred rivers, and the majority of their time is spent absorbed in meditation. They also perform fire sacrifices and worship uh, deities such as in temples, but mostly you'll find them living a very simple, contemplative, intellectual life. And so this is how the Satya Yuga, or the first age of humanity, is described. Most uh, human beings, they're put in the category of hamsa. Anahamsa means like a swan. It's essentially a transcendentalist. So human society was uh, predominated by transcendentalists living in harmony with nature. As we mentioned before, very similar to the ideas of uh, in the Bible of, say, the Garden of Eden. And they would spend most of their time meditating, and they would meditate on the Om. Om. And so the Om is a sacred vibration within the Vedic literature. In fact, it's, it's central to the Vedic literature. All, uh, any type of speaking on the Vedas, it's supposed to begin and end with the Om. The Om is the summum bonum. It's the, the total, complete uh, vibration of reality, both spiritual and material. It's very interesting because when one vibrates the Om, it's actually not O-M or Om, it's actually Aum, and it begins at the back of the throat with Ah, and then it moves into the middle of the mouth as a Aum, and then finally it makes its way towards the lips as an Aum, and then you'll notice it's very interesting that when you close your mouth, the sound actually comes out of your nose. Uh, you may not have noticed that before, but if you go mmm and then you close your no your nostrils, you pinch them shut, mmm, and it stops. You know, no more noise, no more air. You're actually speaking out of your nose whenever you go mmm or n. Mm, then um, and that's known as a bindu. And so you'll see in the om it looks almost like an e with a tail coming out the side of it and then a dot above the tail. That's That dot represents the bindu, or when the vibration comes out of the nose. And according to the science of the language of Sanskrit, all sound or all speech is essentially, it is the om, that sum total of vibration made by the human mouth, you know, beginning in the throat, moving upward through the middle of the mouth and ending at the lips, om. But you're taking that om and you're dividing it up with your lips and with your tongue and reshaping it into words which, which convey ideas and thoughts. And so speech itself is nothing but the chopping up and the reshaping and reforming of the om. And the human mouth is actually formed in such a way that the om is vibrated perfectly. And the om itself is the, the sum total of all creation. Uh, it is all vibration, just like we see in modern science that the, you know, reality is in essence vibration from subtle to gross or from uh, low frequency to high frequency for the electromagnetic spectrum. Everything is essentially vibration at different speeds. And so all taken together, this is the Aum. And there are deeper spiritual meanings of this vibration. 
uh, essentially the ah within the omkar ah the very source of the om that that represents the supreme lord or god and then the aum as it moves through the mouth this represents the energies of god and then finally the the bindu the final point of the om the aum that m represents the jivas or the spirit souls that's us so this Aum also represents the sum total of the spiritual energies of God and his various spiritual manifestations, including us. And because the people of this age were constantly absorbed in meditation, they had a much higher level of consciousness. The different types of bodies that the individual soul inhabits, they really limit the consciousness of the jiva. The consciousness of the soul or the atma, it's full of knowledge, it's full of bliss, and it's eternal, and it's constantly shining out like a spark of spiritual light. And yet when that spark is confined within the body, whether it be the body of an insect, the body of a fish, or a plant, or an animal, or a human being, or you know a higher being such as a god, then that spark or that light will shine out at different degrees of magnitude. Just like, for example, if you have a light bulb, you know, you have a Christmas light, and you might have a 30-watt bulb, then a 60-watt bulb, then a 100-watt bulb. So it's the same electricity that's within the, the bulb, and yet the bulb itself, it, it has a different capacity for conveying that power. And so similarly, the different bodies that the soul inhabits are, have different capacities for allowing the soul to shine out. Uh, and, and so the human form of life, especially at this time and age, it's kind of like a, a dim bulb. You know, the capacity for the soul to shine out is not very strong. The bulb has is almost like it's painted over, you know, with black or something. And, uh, and therefore the light is very dim. And yet in this age, the bulb was much more powerful. Uh, and the consciousness of the soul could manifest in a much more pure way. And for that reason, the perception of reality was different. Just like if you walk in a room with a 60-watt bulb, you know, covered in black paint, you're not going to see very much. It's going to be, uh, you know, you'll have a, a certain picture of what the room is. But if you unscrew that bulb and put in, you know, a 100-watt bulb or even stronger, then your picture of the room is drastically different. It's much more clear. So similarly, the vision of reality at the time was much greater. The individuals, the souls embodied as humans, they saw the world much differently than we do. And therefore you see in these ancient texts, they have greatly different ways of, pers of showing the world. And in you know modern society, we oftentimes call it mythology, because you're seeing a world filled with mystical beings and magical powers and uh, interacting with various gods and ghosts and demons and all sorts of different creatures which we have no experience of today. But this, according to the Vedic literatures, is because the human beings of the time were in a much higher level of consciousness. Or similarly, their view of the world was much different than the one that we have today, how they envisioned reality. Uh, and so if one elevates their consciousness, then their entire vision of reality changes. Uh, the the various higher supernatural beings of the universe, such as the gods, they see the re they see reality much differently than we do, and yet we can also develop a similar view of reality as they do if we purify our consciousness through spiritual practice. And so the individuals living at this time, they had a much purer level of consciousness, and therefore they could interact with the gods and have these mystical, powerful experiences with supernatural beings, and all these fantastic tales are born out of this time frame. And so it's a result of spiritual consciousness. And not only is their vision of reality different than ours, they, they live in a different world almost, but they have access to mystic powers and psychic, psychic abilities that we can't even imagine, as well as having an extended period of life much longer than our own because they lived completely in harmony with nature in a very healthy, purified state of consciousness. And the result of that is good health. And so it was a much different time than the one that we live in today. And it's this time that generally you find the various stories in the Vedas coming from. Uh, and so as we sort of enter into that magical and mystical world of the Vedas, we have to understand this is the world of individuals with consciousness closer to those of the gods 
than to our own. And so over a long period of time, this spiritual consciousness has declined, along with the uh, the perception of reality that accompanied it and the psychic powers that accompanied such intense meditation and yogic practice and also the length of life and the ability of individuals to do amazing things. All of these have gradually dwindled into the point that we're at today and will continue to dwindle into the future. And so over time, this Sati Yuga, this first age of mankind, came to an end. And the practice, the spiritual practice, moved from meditation to that of performing sacrifices with fire. You may have seen the, you know, even performed today, the Vedic fire rituals, where the Brahmin priests, they sit around and cast grains into the fire and chant mantras. So this is the practice of the next age. And so that one transcendental vibration, Aum, it, it manifested as the mantras of the Vedas, which are used in the performance of these sacrifices. That's essentially what the Vedas are, the Rig, Yajur, Tarva, Sama, Veda. They're different mantras used in the performance of sacrifice. And different priests that perform the sacrifice use different portions of that Veda. But the Vedas themselves are manifested within the Omkar. In fact, many of the mantras of the Vedas, they're brought down through the Omkar by various rishis. In other words, these great sages sitting in meditation, listening to the Omkar, within that vibration they extract the various prayers and things that will be used for the rituals. So that's one primary source for the Vedas. They come from the Om itself. And traditionally, before chanting mantras of the Vedas, the chanter would actually pronounce, you know, what meter he's going to chant in, etc., as well as the rishi, who's sort of the lord or the chief of that mantra. He's the one who introduced it and brought it out of the omkar into human society. And another source of these mantras is they come from the very time of creation. There is Brahma, the creator of the universe, the god, the four-headed god, who manifests and organizes reality into what it is, he receives the Vedas as they are from the Supreme Lord Vishnu, who's transcendent beyond matter. And so he takes those mantras. And at the time of creation, the first uh, entities born are these celestial rishis. Uh, he has ten mind-born sons. You know, he just sort of creates them out of himself. And they're not, they have human-like forms, but of course they're not human beings. They're, they're even higher than gods. And they're like principal, the principal sources of creation themselves. And he teaches the Vedas to them. So the Vedas to understood to also be coming down to this succession from Brahma himself from the time of creation. And so during the second age, human society was one of priests centered around performing these ritualistic fire sacrifices and chanting these sacred mantras of the Vedas. But over time, human society became more and more elaborate as people, as their consciousness degraded, and they began to desire to do more things. A warrior class was created, administrative class, a class of businessmen was created, a class of workers, and human society kind of filled out more to what we experience it today. And so the Vedic literatures extended themselves into this society and provided us all sorts of different rules and rituals for how people should live and all sorts of uh, essentially how one should learn and practice the Vedas as they move throughout the various stages of life. One's life begins with careful planning of the parents at the time of conception. The sex act in which, you know, the child is to be born itself is a ritual within the Vedic culture. It's called Garbhadhana Samskar. Essentially, the parents would meditate and perform various rituals to elevate their consciousness before procreating a child. First of all, an astrologically auspicious moment would be chosen using the, uh, the Vedic science of Jyotish or astrology. Uh, one would find a moment in which a pure soul would be born. You might say, like, if you can utilize this sort of spiritual consciousness at the time of uh, a husband and wife having sex, then that creates a rare moment in which a very special soul will take birth. You know, there's many different souls that want to take birth as a human being, and when you have a rare moment where the parents are in pure consciousness, perhaps they're even engaged in prayer, and they're trying to bring forth a very special child, and they have the intention of raising that child in pure spiritual consciousness, that creates a very rare birth. It's almost like you, know, you can imagine like millions of souls lined up 
you know, for the right to take that birth. And then one very special soul will be brought by divine arrangement to the head of the line and take advantage of that birth. So really, life within the Vedic culture, it begins by deliberately calling forth and bringing down a higher soul to take birth. And you're willing to invest heavily within that child and, and essentially give that child all spiritual nourishment they may need and all wisdom. Uh, and so, you know, you have a special soul taking birth. And after the birth itself, there are many purifying rituals to cleanse the child uh, and to purify his consciousness further. So initially, right as the child is born, then there's a ritual performed. And actually the child is brought you know, out of the womb. And before the umbilical cord is even cut, the priest will come forward and there's a golden spoon with, with honey on it that he puts in the child's mouth and he actually chants certain mantras. And, uh, and it's, it's considered to bless the child with intelligence. And uh, also, you know, the, the umbilical cord isn't cut because it's believed that there's a special blood which, or, you know, uh, enzymes which move through the umbilical cord to the child at that time. So there's a good, you know, five, ten minutes after birth that the, the umbilical cord remains. And so the ritual is performed at this time. See, so from the very moment of birth, whereas in modern society, you know, well, at least stereotypically, or like you might see in a cartoon, you know, they pick up the child by the feet and spank it on the butt or something. But oftentimes it's, uh, you know, the emphasis is on medical procedure, you know, just immediately making sure that uh, the child is clean and that it's breathing and everything. And that's very important. But within the Vedic culture at the same time, uh, there's, a, there's a need to perform an immediate spiritual ritual to bless the child with higher intelligence and to essentially bring the child into the world in a spiritual environment of blessings. Uh, and then as the child, you know, is a newborn, then the priest will come and, and create an astrological chart for the child. And that chart can be made from the time of birth. Uh, and the entire life of the child will be predicted. Or they may take the, the time of conception to draw a chart as well. And that's actually considered a more accurate chart. It's when the child actually comes into the womb, or the soul enters into flesh. Uh, and also at that time of birth where that the astrological chart is being cast, the child will be named. And the child will be named according to the the moon's position in the sky and what uh, lunar mansion he is within. Uh, and also the social background of the parents, all these things, the sex of the child, all that is considered. But the child is given a sacred name. Uh, and so that's, that's called the name-giving ceremony. Uh, and then as the child moves to the first stages of life, maybe the first, you know, six, seven years, then there's many different rituals that are performed, you know. Most of them are actually there within the first, you know, two, three, four years. But the child's first hairs that he had that while well within the womb, those are cut, you know, his first hairs are shaven. He also eats grains for the first time. So while performing these rituals, the priest is chanting all sorts of uh, purifying mantras and blessing the child. So it's like in the first years of life, the child is really inundated with many, many different rituals. Uh, and his life is sanctified as he grows. And then when the child reaches a certain age, you know, from five to eight years old, pretty much the same time that we begin going to school, the child is initiated into the Vedas. This is known as Upanayanam, uh, and he'll receive the sacred thread, uh, which you'll see if traditional pictures of Brahmins and priests, they have this kind of white thread looped around, uh, around their shoulder, uh, crossing across their chest. So uh, that means that one has been initiated into the Vedas and one will begin chanting the Brahma Gayatri Mantra. The teacher will initiate the young child into this mantra, and he'll chant that mantra a certain amount each day. He might chant it 108 times in the morning, 108 times in the midday, and 108 times in the evening. Oftentimes there'll be a, uh, a ritual associated with the chanting of that mantra. You know, the child will, will sit down and uh, sip water and do a purificatory ritual, call down the mantra, worship the mantra. It's like a good half hour ritual before the individual begins chanting. And then they'll chant, you know, for a good, what, almost an hour or something, chanting this mantra, which begins Om Pur Bhuvasva. It's actually a secret mantra. Uh, but everyone within the Vedic literature who's, who's initiated into the Vedas would know this mantra and be chanting it. And it's essentially, it's a prayer to the sun god. 
um, but ultimately to the Supreme Lord within the Son, who gives one dhiya, or the power of pure consciousness and intelligence, the power to see things clearly in the light of spiritual truth. And so one is, is praying to the Sun God or that Supreme Lord within the Sun God, giving the power to the Sun God, the source of the Sun God's power, to enlighten one with spiritual consciousness. And one would chant this at the Sandhyas, or when the sun is, is first rising, and when the sun is at the midheaven, and then when the sun is setting. And so the child will be initiated into this. And it's very similar to the Catholic baptism. And the child is then indoctrinated into the Vedas. Like the, he'll go to the Gurukul, he'll leave the home of his parents. And usually within the same uh, village, he's not like far from his parents, but just, just down the street or something. Then he lives with the teacher. And he lives in the what's called the Gurukul. And the guru will raise him along with all the other boys in the neighborhood and educate him, essentially. And, uh, and so the, he begins the life of what is known as a brahmachari or a monk. And a brahmachari means brahma achar, means the, the achar or the behavior of brahman or spirit or transcendence. So he's learning the how to behave in accordance with the laws which guide one upwards towards spiritual consciousness. So within Vedic culture, everyone begins life essentially being a monk, and you're trained up very seriously by your guru. And your life is predominated by three things. You're doing service to the guru, you're studying the Vedas and memorizing them, and you're going out and begging. And so uh, these things are all very important. So the, the student will do very humble service for the guru. In fact, the first service is generally considered to be uh, collecting firewood for the guru's sacrifices, his fire sacrifices that he performs. So the young boys, they'll go out into the woods and, you know, they'll collect this, this, uh, this wood and bring it back to the ashram or the place of the guru. And then they'll spend the morning chanting the Samhita, or they'll come together and they'll chant, you know, for quite a few, you know, perhaps a couple hours, chanting these mantras of the Vedas, and thus, you know, repeating them and repeating them, and meditating upon them, learning what they mean, as well as memorizing them. And then these mantras are used throughout one's life in the performance of sacrifices. Uh, and then finally they'll go out begging, which is, you know, basically the children and the ashram of the guru is sustained by charity. And so the boys, even they may be the son of a king or the son of a priest, or they may be a businessman's son, or it doesn't matter. They all go out together, and they go from door to door. And so you might have, you know, the, the, there's a, a woman at home, and she's uh, boiling milk or something like that, and then she'll hear a knock on her door. You know, and she comes to the door, and it's three little boys from the local uh, school, basically. And they're asking, you know, they say, Bhavati Bhikshum Dehi, or, you know, they, there's a certain way of greeting in a very formal way the woman, and asking for a donation. And so she'll put within their little bowl or their, their little cloth, you know, a, a handful of rice for each of them. And then they'll take that back to the guru, and then all of that is collected, and that's what they eat for the day. So in that way, the school is supported by the donations given to the students. But there's an important reason for this, even more than just eating, is that the children learn humility, and they learn respect. So you might even have the son of a king who's out begging, you know, and therefore he learns to have a respectful attitude, especially towards women, right? So... There's a sense in which the, the Vedic culture very strongly values humility. And all of these things are associated with his learning. Because uh, to learn the Vedic literatures is non-different from humility. Like knowledge and humility are synonymous within the Vedas. And therefore, the more that you're humble, the more you can understand the scriptures. So when they beg for the grains and things like that, they're really supposed to be developing a sense of humility and a sense of respect for others and tolerance and kindness and, and detachment because not everyone may give the, the food, right? It's a very embarrassing thing to ask people for money. You know, it's a very embarrassing thing. And so you, you have to be in a certain consciousness of humility and detachment. And so they're meant to develop that and that helps them to understand what they're learning, the spiritual truth they're learning as well as the, the service to the guru, that helps them realize that truth as well. Because it is, you know, one may memorize all the mantras and learn the philosophy, but you don't really realize it until you put it into practice. And so by serving the guru in various ways, 
uh, you're essentially applying the philosophy and thus learning it. So the, there's different stages in which the, the student is, learns. There's the hearing stage, and then there's the contemplation stage, where the student is meant to think very deeply about these philosophical subject matters. And then there's the applied stage, where you then take that action and transform, you take that knowledge, rather, and you transform it into service, and you put it into practice. And then finally, once you've put it into practice, then you actually realize the knowledge. So all of these different stages are practiced by the children at this Gurukul, or the house of the Guru. Thank you very much for listening. If you found value in this, please like and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, please visit srisachinandana.com backslash iTunes and leave a positive review. Thank you again, and we hope you'll join us next time on Light of the Vedas.